Sounds good. Thanks, Lydia. Um, I've joked with Lydia and, and Ray and Max that when I think about the, the cover crops and, and conservation farming and things like that, that what we're doing on our farm is just kind of tip of the iceberg, you know? So for a, a conference like this today, um, I guess you'd say I'm teaching the 101 course uh, and Ray and, and Max are, uh, are, are teaching the graduate level stuff. So um, like Lydia said, my name's Ryan Corey. Um, Lydia, you can go on to the next slide, please. A um, little bit of background on our, our operation here. So we farm about 2,800 acres of corn, soybeans, and uh, we do have a little bit of wheat planted here this fall, about 60 acres for the first time since 2012, but we've had some wheat acres. Uh, we farm in, in Northern Schuyler and Southern McDonough counties, which is in, in West Central Illinois. Um, if you look at the state of Illinois, the map of the state of Illinois, and, and it's kind of got that hump on the West side where the Mississippi River cuts out, we're kind of right in the center of that. Um, about an Iowa, excuse me, about an hour from the, the, the borders with with Iowa and Missouri. Um, we run a family corporation here. Um, my grandfather started uh, when he got out of high school in the 30s. Um, he incorporated in 1974. And so now that is, is primarily run by myself. My father, I have an uncle that's been involved in the operation basically his entire life. And then I also have a son who's, who's 16 and, and a daughter who's 15. And they both like to help as well. So hopefully what we're doing here um, both in terms of a farming operation as well as cover crops is building a better, uh, better future for, for them to come back to the operation. Um, next slide, please, Lydia. A uh, little bit about our, our uh, uh, I guess I kind of put together a timeline for how we, we got into, into cover crops. And it, it really started in the early 90s when my, my dad and my grandfather um, sold the, the moldboard plows and, and bought a couple of no-till drills and, and just as a way to not have to have the high horsepower tractors anymore. Um, we also still had hogs and, and cattle at that time. So a way to reduce, reduce hours in the field and, and time constraints. Um, then in the mid 1990s, uh, we began strip tilling corn. Uh, we strip tilled anhydrous into into soybean stubble uh, and then planted on top of those strips the following year that picture there obviously is not our our uh, strip till rig from the early 90s um, that's what we currently run um but uh so i guess our farm has not been a a stranger to um you know being a pioneer in terms of no-till and and strip till and things like that so next slide please Um, 2012 was really the, the start of our, our uh, journey with cover crops. So my father-in-law um, has never really been involved in farming, but he runs a garden center and a landscaping business. And so for several years, he had been using tillage radishes in his tree field, in his tree beds. Um, after he harvested trees in the late summer or, or early fall, he would, would see tillage radishes on those beds and he had been had been pushing my my father and I for several years to to um, you know to incorporate some some cover crops some radishes some things like that so we actually seeded his few his acres to wheat in 2012 and then we drilled tillage radishes into those in the summertime and then turned around and strip tilled corn um, into that uh, that that fall um, or strip tilled anhydrous into that that fall to plant corn the following spring. And I will apologize too, I, I had several other slides that kind of, or several other pictures that go along with some of these, uh, these points that were on a, another device that I was unable to, to recover those pictures. So there's some of these things that uh, if somebody wonders why does this guy continue to show pictures of a tractor, um, it's because I didn't have the pictures available that I, I wanted to put in some of these slots. But um, in 2013, then, uh, following, following corn harvest, we, we took several farms and we had our, our fertilizer dealer, our retailer, blend in cereal rye in with the potash. Uh, then we followed that with a vertical till pass into corn stalks uh, you know, to, to, cut, to size that residue. Um, the vertical till pass was something that we were, were already doing on our corn stalks following harvest. 
just to size the residue to, to get ready to no-till soybeans into the following spring. Um, then in, in 2014, we sold our, our last no-till drill that we had and traded that for a, a Valmar air seeder that we then added to, to this setup that you see there. Um, and the next several slides kind of show very different pictures of that. So um, go ahead, Lydia. Um, so it's a uh, it's a Valmar box. Um, when we first when we first made that investment, uh, that box sat up above the tongue of the of the tool um, because with a with that particular tool with the cross accelerator, the wings fold too tight to put it in the center of the of the tool. So it was sitting up above the above the tongue, kind of cantilevered out over the tongue. Um, we ran it that way for two or three years. That platform that you can see there behind the, the red box when it was up above the tongue was probably six or seven feet off the ground. Not a ton of railing uh, protection there um, to that right side of the picture. And, and um, a lot of the time my dad was the one out, out while we were, the rest of the crew was, was busy with harvest. Dad would go seed cover crops and, and um, didn't really feel like it was the best thing to have that box that high off the ground with him out by himself doing that. So we, uh, we'd since bought a, a, a three point uh, hitch caddy, I guess you'd say, um, which there's, you can move on to the next slide, Lydia. Um, so there you can see the, the three point hitch caddy a little closer. Um, so it just mounts to the quick hitch of the tractor. And then you actually pull your tool uh, from the back of the, of the caddy there. And it got that a lot closer to the ground um, maybe not quite as, as dangerous or as much of a, of a fall risk there. Um, one issue that we have had with that tool, so you can see above the orange tongue there, the green hoses running from the cedar, and those run all the way back to the back of the machine. Um, one thing that we've had trouble with with this particular setup has been just because you're blowing the, the seed so far, any sort of, of air pressure drop that you have with that system, you can plug hoses really quick. And unfortunately, a lot of times you don't catch that until it starts to, to come up and you, you streak the field or maybe when you're, you're refilling the hopper and, and realize that you're, you've got several lines plugged. So um, we, uh, that's part of why later in the, in the presentation, I'll show you the different tool that we've bought, but um, you can move on to the next slide, Lydia. So this is just a, a back view of the of the tool. So it actually blows the seed. You can see the hoses that come out there um, off the back and they mount to the brackets that hold the rolling baskets there. Um, and they blow the seed forward up around those star wheels or treader wheels there. Um, with the cereal, cereal rye, it doesn't take a lot of seed to soil contact to, to get germination. Um, we've joked that if you had, if you could get some moisture, you could probably get cereal rye to grow on the top of a fence post. Um, doesn't take a whole lot of soil contact there. Um, next slide, Lydia. Um, in 2014, again, we, uh, we also aerial seeded some annual rye and crimson clover uh, into standing soybeans. Um, we had, where we had seed, we had a great, great stand, uh, like carpet in your living room, but we had 100, 120 foot gaps in between. Um, so we didn't have good luck with the aerial seating and for the cost of it, we decided, uh, we have not used that since. We've also in, in probably 2015 and 16, uh, following some early harvested soybeans, we We've seeded oats and, and tillage radish with that same tool. Um, and then in middle of November, late November, uh, have gone ahead and strip tilled our anhydrous into that, that standing oats and radish mix. That's been something that has worked, worked really well. We haven't done it the last two or three years just because of we've had several wet falls in a row uh, here in West Central Illinois that, that have not allowed us to to get that done in the right conditions. Um, really since 2014 or 15, we've, we've continued to seed, you know, our, our primary, primary cover crop is cereal rye, um, following corn um, on as much as a thousand acres a year, I guess. And then, then no-till soybeans ended up the following year. 
Um, we did in 2017, uh, learned a lot, I guess, about, about spray timing and, and weather and, and what not to do. Um, before that, we had always tried to, to terminate the rye before it got to knee high, when we got to 10 or 12 inches in height. Um, that year was our first year of doing our own spraying. The, the uh, equipment dealership and the, our ag leader dealer were slow getting the, the sprayer set up for us and the rye got away from us. And we had waist high rye. Uh, I sprayed rye on a Thursday, on a Friday, terminating it um, with the intention of, of planting beans into it, you know, starting the following Monday. On Saturday, we we're supposed to get a half inch of rain and we got six and a half inches of rain. So we had waist high rye uh, in a swamp um, that obviously at that stage, we would have been much better off to let the rye grow. So it continued to suck, suck moisture out of the ground. But um, we had a bit of a disaster, uh, probably replanted, replanted half of our beans that year. And, and the worst thing about it was into that, that amount of cover you just couldn't hardly scout to, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't see what needed replanted and what didn't. So we basically had to drive every single acre, um, increasing population, decreasing population, raising and lowering the planter. Um, so ever since then, we've tried to be a little more diligent about, about back to our original plan of terminating the rye at, at 10 to 12 inches tall. Um, next slide, if you would, buddy. Um, so the last couple of years here, uh, we have a couple of, of hog buildings here, uh, three miles in either direction from us. And so we've been getting a lot more hog manure, um, which has led us to, to, do a, to do more fall tillage than what we normally had or what we would like to. Uh, one thing we have been able to incorporate into those acres here the last couple of years has been uh, getting some cereal rice seeded on a lot of those acres that are going to soybeans to, to try to keep that, that manure from leaching and running away from us. Um, that photo there is a, a picture of the tool that we've, we've traded for. We ran the, uh, the John Deere vertical till tool this fall, but the Montag cedar part was not ready um, in time. So we've got it here in the shop to, to put on here over the winter and get ready for next year. But um, looking forward to running that tool just because as you can see the, the box mounts in the center of that tool so we're going to be blowing the seed a lot shorter distance and hopefully eliminate some of those uh some of those problems that um that we've had with plugging lines and and dropping air pressure and things like that so um next slide that's all i've got so I'm not sure how long that took but uh thank you very much and and uh, appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Ryan. That was great. Um, great way to get us started. And um, if you have any questions for Ryan, please enter them into that chat box um, on the mm -hmm. browser screen. And then I will relay those after Ray and Max um, give their presentations. But we are going to hop right along. So Ray, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Uh, Thank you, Lydia, and thank you everyone for allowing me to come into your home from my office. I'm going to try to explain 25 years of using cover crops and no-till in 10 minutes. So where I'm located is in southwestern Indiana. As you can see, I farm both on the Illinois and Indiana side. The land that I farm is windblown lust from the Ice Age, and there's, so there's sand all along the river on the bluffs, and then it's loamy soils, uh, very deep, 80 to 200 foot deep. And then there's four rivers that come together here from the outwash of the glaciers. So I farm big river bottom fields, steep rolling lust and sand fields. So it's a great variety of soils. And my climate would be different than those in Iowa or north of us. So I'm about 60 miles south of 70 and about 50 miles north of the Ohio River. So Everything I say, you can take the principles in, but you'll have to learn what works best in your area. I got started no-tilling in June of 1986. So my fertilized dealer, a very smart man, I said, what about this no-till? And he says, it will work, but you must do it exactly as I tell you. So he said, 
the day you pick the corn, we're going to come in there and spread a bushel of wheat with potash. And then in the spring, we're going to kill that and you're going to rent a drill. Well, he was a very smart man. He got me started with cover crops, but the neighbor wouldn't rent me the drill until he was done. And you can see the wheat's heading out and I never planted into this, but here's the 40, 4320 and my friend and my first hour of planting into cover crops. Well, lo and behold, not only did we save soil there, but those beans were the highest yielding beans by five bushel an acre of anywhere we had. Well, then I evolved into using a drill to plant cover crops. And this is an example, uh, back up one, please, Lydia. This is an example of what we were planting. This is 30 pounds of cereal rye and 30 pounds of Austrian winter peas. So that's what we would plant with the drill where we were going to corn and where we were going to beans, we'd go 60 pounds of cereal rye. Okay, move on, Lydia. And this was an example of our older planter planting into that uh, standing green uh, Austrian winter peas and cereal rye. Very easy to kill, great stands, but it was a little expensive, but we had to use a drill to get it established. And so we had my son off of the combine or hauling with semis out here drilling cover crops. Go ahead, Lydia. One of the big advancements we made was buying a, at an auction, a new till system on a planter. So we went from, you know, what you're not supposed to do. We went from planting with no starter, no two by two to this planter system where we were putting pop up in the row and nitrogen at two by two. And we had a huge increase in yield. So Planters are important. I've got a horse 24 row planter now with a different system and, and no row cleaners and so forth because I want minimum disturbance. But I'm not here to talk about planters, so let's move on. So the thrill of discovery is a common thread among those of us that use cover crops and no-till. Uh, we are, you know, a common thread of innovators, risk takers, and those not willing to, to quit because you failed. So failure is part of this system. Fortunately, this has been around for decades now and a lot of the mistakes I made is not necessary anymore because we have experienced speakers and, and field days and so forth where you can avoid many of the mistakes I made early on doing it on my own. Next slide, please. So one of the things I advanced to is I laid awake many nights thinking about having my son out there drilling cover crops right during harvest, I called Balmar and said, I need a cedar to put on my combine. They said, okay, we can have you one in six months. So I called Gandhi. They said, okay, we can have you one in six weeks. And I said, I need one in six hours. And they said, well, we got one back here. We've tore all apart for parts. You want it? I said, yeah, it was at my John Deere dealer the next day. And what we did was we were gonna to try to see if it works. So we had never tried this in this photograph, we're getting ready to try for the first time to find out why it won't work and what we can do next year. So move on to the next slide. It only took us a few hours. So we're plugging into the hydraulics, the quick attach on the throat of the combine. And then we ran a wire up into the cab with an on off switch. So this is driven by an electric motor. So it turns at the same rate all the time, but it just took us a few hours to mount it on the head. Next slide, please. And we crudely mounted a deflector between the rows. So our, my theory was is, and if you listen to ever listen to Calm, uh, Palmer talk about corn heads is most of your residue should go through the corn head. So I thought about that and I said, then we want the seed on the ground before the fodder goes through the corn head. So we decided to splat, splatter the seed out under the noses and let the stock rollers put the trash on top of the seeds. We're essentially mulching the seed as we pick. Next slide, please. So there we go. We're out in the field and we're we're picking corn and we're seeding at the same time. So it doesn't matter whether it's raining, hasn't rained, just rained or rains an inch at night, the seeds on the ground and ready to go. And we're blowing it on with an air seeder. So you can see the hoses as they twist behind the head and go down between each roll. And the distance is short here because 
as Ryan said, plugging of the hose is not a good thing. You know, Ryan and I, we, I started out moldboard plowing as a little kid. And even when I was out of college, we were moldboard plowing all those river bottoms. Now I'm embarrassed if one of the rows is plugged up and it's not solid green. So what you're embarrassed about when you plowed and what you're embarrassed about when you know till cover crops is a, a great distance apart. Go ahead with the next slide. So there's that first 300 acres we tried and you know what I said I can't figure out what's wrong because I can't everything's working and the seeds going on and nothing's plugging up and by golly that field when it came up it was a beautiful stand to cover crops so I've been refining it ever since so let's go to the next slide and this is what it can look like so again I'm in southern Indiana so we pick pretty early and we get a lot of warm weather. The cover crops outside my window right now are still green and they're still growing and they're putting down roots. So we're really capturing sunlight through photosynthesis and building our soils even today at the middle of January. If we had had cold weather by the middle of February, it would have greened back up and we're back to building our soils. We also run cattle on that now and we also harvest cover crops for haylage for our cattle. So next slide, please. Then I said, well, why don't we do it on a platform? So Gandhi sent me their prototype of the cedars that you could put on a platform. So we mounted it on there and you can see that on a platform, you blow it out behind the head. There's no opportunity to put it in front of the head and you're essentially using the chopper to mulch the seed as it hits the ground. So there's my first tries at uh, using an air seeder on a platform. And you can see white hoses there running by in front of the front right tire. So you have to put three deflectors under the throat on the axle so that it's spreading the cover crop in that feeder house area. So in this case, you do have to disconnect and connect three more hoses unlike on the corn head. Next slide, please. And this is what we were looking for is a diversity of cover crops that'll, you know, not only benefit building the soil, but also building nitrogen in the field. So letting that cover crop grow as many days as possible is one of our goals now because you can gain a tremendous amount of biomass the last week. So killing it early, I'm not a fan of that. And we've got a planter that can go through anything. So next slide, please. So here's my cost, which doesn't matter to me that much because I'm gonna grow cover crops no matter what the cost is because it's a pay in proposition. But when you take out buying equipment, having airplanes fly it on, chopping up your tires on your drill and tractors and everything, basically I paid for my seed or the first year, but this is my seed cost in the fall of 2020. So we're putting on ryegrass and turnips ahead of soybeans. Uh, the ryegrass I bought for 76 cents a pound brought in bulk straight on a truck from Washington State or Oregon and then 13 pounds of acre of uh, 13 pounds of acre of total so there's one pound of turnip mix and about 12 pounds of cereal rye that cost is about nine dollars and 88 cents an acre I'm not sure you can rip or chisel plow for that price but that's my actual price this fall next slide please and this is the nitro mix that I use on all the ground where we're going with corn. 92 cents a pound for the, I think the annual ryegrass, but the combination of the two is $11.96 per acre. Now this can change a little bit if it's a real flood plone area or it gets late, I might switch to straight annual ryegrass. So that would bring it down to about nine dollars an acre or something like that but those are some of the cost i have that really make it affordable to do it and again i buy it all in bulk delivered put it in a seed tender and we fill our uh, air seeders from a seed tender so it only takes a couple minutes and we're getting 40 to 50 acres now per fill up go ahead to the next slide please so this is an important slide to for me is this is the chisel plowed ground in the river bottoms and it's had all the stalks washed over next to the oxbow lake and here 
on the right is where I put cover crop in, in the river bottoms, and it's anchored down all that crop residue, which is worth a fortune. Um, a few years ago, we did a soil boring down in there in a field where we put cover crops on for the first time. We bored down and got a three inch core. The bore would go four foot and there was plenty of roots from that annual ryegrass at four foot deep. So imagine in these deep river bottom soils, what you're bringing up to the surface and how much residue you're saving. Next slide, please. So here's what we're, we're using now in the fall of 2020. Again, we're trying to evolve every year, try things, take risks. Here we took the cedar off the corn head and the cedar that we first put on our original uh, regular John Deere platform. And so you see we're running two of them and we're looping the hydraulics around with a draper head. There is a hydraulic fitting for a hydraulic drive center auger. And we use that port and spread the oil around and you can use uh, on off for different swaths with these cedars. But essentially, that's where we're doing. And also what's important is you see we're spreading the residue pretty uniform. Phil Needham would tell you exactly how important it is that your platform matches your combine so that even residue uh, distribution is not only important to nutrients, but in my case, important to spreading over the top of the cover crop. Go ahead to the next slide. This year also, we switched from that 10 cubic foot Gandhi to a Valmar, which is four times as big. It's also hydraulically driven, so you can do variable rates. Uh, you can change rates on the go. It has a monitor. It has swath control. So it's a big update from what we had, but it's a hydraulic drive. You have to probably buy uh, additional uh, hardware and software to make it work, but this is run off of our screen, our John Deere uh, screen that we use when we're harvesting. So next slide, please. And there it is in the field. So it's pretty heavy when it's full and it's a lot on the hydraulics. And, and those of you that are smarter than I can figure out how to put bigger cylinders or add additional cylinders under the throat. But when the throat's flexing and following the ground, it has a little bit of trouble keeping the left side up when that cedar's completely full. But again, we're putting on very accurately now, and uh, we don't fill up, but you know we go four times as far as we used to with the other cedar. Next slide, please. So this is a transform of consciousness. You know, when you go from moldboard plowing over the last 25 years to where we're trying to do two things at once or three things at once as we're harvesting, it's the innovation that so many farmers have come up with that have driven the soil health movement. Next slide, please. And so, you know, we saw a picture of the neighbor's ground in the river bottoms, and here's my ground on the left in the river bottoms, exactly the same soils. I know till and use cover crops, he doesn't. I've only done it for, you know, a couple decades down there, but look at the difference in the soil. So using a shovel to dig down gives you a great appreciation for what no-till and cover crops can do for you. Um, is my organic matter going up? Nope, because our biology is thriving on that carbon that's brought into the soil. So we like to look at the soil with a shovel and not with a soil test when it comes to organic matter and carbon, because when it's warm like it is today, all that carbon's being converted into biological life, and that's what feeds your corn. Go ahead to the next one, please. Here's, you know, I said a transformation of consciousness. So I was listening to a podcast and finally I said, I'm going to listen to the only one I haven't heard about 60 inch row corn. I heard that and I said, I got to do that. So here's some 60 inch row corn I did this year where you double the population and then planted a six way mix of cover crops in between the rows. And we were trying to do this so that when we picked this corn, there would be a tremendous amount of biomass for feeding my cattle. So one of the reasons, there's several reasons you might grow cover crops in between your corn rows, but feeding cattle in our case was one of our goals of trying 60 inch corn. Let's go ahead to the next slide, please. So that uh, change in consciousness 
you know, this is what happened in Indiana uh, back in the, uh, I think this is 2008. We had one of those big rainfalls you, you can get. And of course, it flooded and we lost all of our crops and the river bottoms, though we didn't get any rain. But this is what happened across most of that patch of 11 inch rain in central Indiana, where there was no till cover crops, wasps, conservation practices in place. It saved it. Here, obviously, conventional tillage didn't do the trick. Next slide, please. So this is my home and my family. You know, people use cover crops and promote cell health for many reasons, but for a lot of us, it's about taking care of the land for our family. So welcome into my home. It's as much about dogs as it is my children, but uh, it sure is a way to leave your legacy on the land. Next uh, slide, please. So. You know, I don't know how many of you have followed the campaigns and so forth, but there's a lot of talk about, you know, putting things together to, you know, unite our country. And my belief is, let's go to the next slide. My belief is it's not going to be Congress and the acts of Congress that are going to take care of our land. It's going to be the action of you farmers out there and everyone participating in this moment, our actions are going to be what saves our land and what protects the planet. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, I hope that I've stimulated some good thoughts on what we all can do in conservation in the future. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ray. That was great. And uh, you had a lot of awesome information in there. And so if folks do have any questions for Ray, please put those in the chat box. I already see a couple have come through, but I'm going to hold off on asking those until our last presenter, Max Pitt, gives his talk and then we'll go into some of those Q&A. But please continue to put your questions in the chat box. Max, you are welcome to take it away. Great. Thank you, Lydia. So as Liddy said, I'm Max Pitt. I'm in South Central Iowa, Lamoni, Iowa, straight south of Des Moines on uh, I-35. And I work at Graceland University. I have some test plots there that we can work with. Uh, this first slide, um, I, it's my way of kind of acknowledging there's a number of folks involved in this research from IDOL's grant to Montag and Sunco, uh, Graceland certainly. Holness Investments is an LLC that my wife and I have. So you can see a picture there of of our prototype that has some drill components attached to the combine. So Lydia, if you'd go on to the next. Getting a little closer, you can begin to see it features coulter. So dealing with some of that seed to soil contact, maybe a little bit farther north of a latitude than, than Ray is, for example, and trying to get that consistent germination is certainly a part of what we're after with the coulters being attached to the combine. Go on to the next one, please. This is our first working prototype. It was in the fall of 19, to kind of put it in perspective. We were harvesting beans. In the fall of 19, I did not have cultures attached to, the, to a corn head or to the rear of the combine when we were harvesting corn yet, but that was our, our first, um, I'll say, success story. I'll draw your attention to the right side of that screen. You'll see uh, in the background, there's rows of rye growing. Well, that was actually this field in April of 2020. So in November of 19, we're harvesting, and then you can see the emerging uh, winter rye or the rye that had emerged. Uh, it actually emerged in the fall. Uh, and then of course we uh, went into dormancy, but by April, that's what we were looking at. You look at the next one, Lydia, please. This is shows some improvements uh, in 2020. So we're still working on things with regard to the prototype. Differences or notable difference would be the, the double disc cultures that Sunco provided, and that we attached more of the cultures behind the rear axle for corn. On this, uh, when you're looking at the soybean platform, you'd have noticed there were uh, attachments to the outer edge or the uh, both sides of the soybean platform. And in the middle section, we had the cultures attached behind the rear axle uh, on this toolbar. Next one. So I focus in here for a couple of pictures just to get a feel for, okay, what do you need to do with those coulters? One of them is that they can pivot well for curves uh, in the field. We do lift them as you get to the end, but uh, in the field, the ability to, to not put additional stress on coulters or the machine as it goes through the field on some of the curvy rows we're after. The next. 
We also have them that they'll adjust individually. So certainly the uneven terrain and the issues that we need to, to deal with, uh, this has worked pretty well. Next one. We also are using a Montag uh, uh, system. This meter is hydraulically powered and we've had consistent air delivery uh, because of that. Uh, we also have some pretty long hoses that run from front to back, but we've managed to, to not have uh, the plugging issues that we heard of. Just to give you some idea, in, in 2019, out of just purely getting started, we, we put on 50 pounds to the acre and then separately through the in-cab monitor, made some adjustment and, and went to a 30 pound to try different rates. Uh, in 2020, I have a tendency to say one of the advantages of using this system is use less seed. So we uh, tried 40 pounds and 25 pounds, and we'll see what that happens. We also did a new test with uh, five pounds to the acre of modified pennycrest. So uh, it'll be interesting to see. We only put that out on about uh, six acres, but uh, pennycrest at five pounds to the acre going through a meter system like that and are my compliments to Montag for finding the way to, to slow down that shaft and change the, 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 the cup sizes in the wheels in order to actually uh, go from on the same machine, five pounds the acre to as many as what, you know, some 50 pounds the acre if we wanted to on winter rye. Next, Lydia. Just had to throw this in here. I was harvesting corn and I was about ready to leave the field and I looked back and saw that full moon and saw where the combine was sitting. So I want you to know I even harvested the moon in October. Next. These are the rows of rye on November the 7th. And why I took this particular picture is because on the right side is what's emerging out of the 40 pounds to the acre. And what's on the all center to left is what was emerging on the 25 pounds to the acre. So, you know, a noticeable difference even uh, in the month following here. And this is in the, corb uh, the soybean stubble, if you will. Let me show the next one. Our friends at uh, Covercrest down in St. Louis were pretty happy that we had some pennycrest that was even emerging. Um, I don't know that I was overly impressed. You can see I laid a knife out there just to kind of give you an idea of just how small those plants were that we were seeing in November, but that is the modified pennycrest emerging. I asked Lydia to show just a few clips uh, instead of a full video so you can get a feel for how things work. This is all taken from uh, the fall of, of 2019. So we're with you, Lydia. Welcome to Graceland University's Agricultural Business Test Plots near Lamoni, Iowa. I am Max Pitt. I coordinate Graceland's Agricultural Business Program and I am a member of Wholeness Investments, LLC. In the next two minutes, Montag Equipment is a participant in the research and has provided the seed monitor and system that delivers the rye seed to the coulters behind the platform on each side and near the rear axle of the drill combine. Harvesting and drilling, rolling forward to April 2020. Now you can see rows of rye from the drill combine at 50 pounds per acre on 15 inch rows. The coulters provided seed to soil contact that resulted in an estimated stand between 600,000 and 800,000 plants per acre. Our evaluation is that this is a very good outcome from a prototype machine with an amateur operator. In so thank you, Lydia, I appreciate that. And uh, particularly appreciate uh, Ryan and Ray for, for setting the stages and kind of walking us through the uh, history that I can identify with from moldboard plow to uh, cover crop. And certainly then that constant need to test and modify and continue to experiment with things. So uh, we look forward to continued research. And uh, so far, we're pretty pleased that we've got uh, a working prototype out of the drill combine. Great, thank you, Max. Um, that was awesome. And thank you to all of our speakers. I am going to stop sharing my screen so that we can see all of them at the same time and then um, opening it up for question and answer. So I see there's already some questions in the chat box. So I will start firing those off. And then if you have more questions for our speakers, please uh, don't hesitate to put those in the chat box in your browser window. 
Okay, so um, here's a question, Ryan, I'm going to start with you, a question for you. So um, it, this question is, when building strips a month or so after seeding covers, how have they looked in the spring? Are you having problems with germination in the strip? No, not at all. Um, on our, our strip till bar, uh, we run a case 950 uh, anhydrous bar that has row cleaners. Uh, and then we also run uh, row cleaners, floating row cleaners on our, our Kinsey planner in the spring. So uh, we haven't had any issues with germination in the strip. Um, we have had some issues uh, uh, with some allelopathic effects we felt like from cereal, cereal rye on corn that we stripped into cereal rye. Um, and so I guess that's one reason why we haven't done some of that, but just feel like having that clean strip to plant into has benefited us um, and seeing, uh, seeing some negative effects from not having that. So Great. we've had a good trip, no issues. So. Perfect. Um, Ray, there's a couple questions here for you about like species that you're using. So first, can you just say again, what's in the 60-40 nitro mix? And then second, could you talk about why you're using annual ryegrass versus cereal rye? All right. So when I converted over to that small cedar box, seed size was everything because I wanted to be able to get as many acres as possible. So I switched over to annual ryegrass and annual ryegrass with turnips and annual ryegrass of crimson clover because of the seed size. But, you know, as I've looked at getting bigger cedars and going to cereal rye, my, my consultant that sells me all the seed says, it's not about what's on top of the ground, it's about what's under the ground. So I think I'm gonna stay with annual ryegrass and crimson clover as the 60-40 mix before corn and about 12 pounds of annual ryegrass and one pound of turnips in front of beans. And that gets you a long way. Those are very small seed sizes. The annual ryegrass, because I have so much river bottoms and so forth, it likes water. Water kills cereal rye. So we can have annual ryegrass that goes under six foot of water in the winter and it'll be lush and green and, and very still benefiting me in the spring where cereal rye will be killed out by ponding water or flood water and so forth. So we like that. If it gets late in the season, let's say in November, we might plant just straight annual ryegrass and not put in clover or not put in turnips because they're not going to survive very well if they don't get any growth or if it becomes very cold. So we will switch in the later part of the season, just straight annual ryegrass. What was the other question? What's in the, um, did you already mention what's in the 60-40 nitro mix? Yeah, yeah. Okay. 60% annual ryegrass, 40% okay. crimson clover. Perfect. That was it. Okay, here's a question. Um, I'm not sure who this is for because I'm not totally literate enough in machinery, um, but there's a question about is there a safety override um, so that you can't back up with the toolbar in the ground? That's probably addressed to me. Great. <laughs> <laughs> and there needs to be. Uh, the prototype as at present does not have one, uh, but there will be before it is ever something that that others would would uh, feel more comfortable using because that's one of the things you got to completely be conscious of is it's not something you want to back up with. You want to raise it before you back up. So whether that's every time it goes into reverse and uh, uh, want to have it built into where, although also raising head for that matter. I, I have the interest in that when the head comes up, everything comes up, but that's a, a future development. Perfect. Um, Excellent question by someone, by the way. They should have been in the cab with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and here's a question for each of you. So I'll have Max, you start. Um, so how many acres an hour can you all seed? So a lot of times we hear that time is, is of the essence in the fall. So I'm curious um, if you could say just roughly how many um, acres an hour you're able to seed. Um, I, would, I would have to say that in what I've done, I've not tested how fast I can go with it. It's more of the operator and the circumstances. So when others will be running three and a half, four, four and a half miles an hour, I've been running two, two and a half miles an hour, if that makes any sense. So that's the way that I've looked at it. 
and it needs to be able to get to where uh, it cannot, uh, we cannot afford to delay harvest. So it'll have to run at the, at the three and a half to four and a half miles per hour. Ryan, what about you? Yeah, so um, I guess one of the benefits of the vertical till tool is we, we, we try to run it, you know, eight to 10 mile an hour. Um, so with the 25 foot tool that we had, we were probably covering 25 or so acres an hour. Um, the new tool that we've got uh, for the coming year is, is a 30 foot tool um, and with it on a little bit bigger tractor, uh, hopefully we can cover 30, 35 acres an hour or something like that. So. Ray? Well, I mean, since I'm already harvesting, whatever you harvest per hour is what you're seeding. So the seeding time is zero. So the extra time that it takes is the time it takes to fill up the tender. So every 50 acres, it's taken us two to three minutes. If somebody's got it folded out, ready to go with it on the head means you can just slide under it and turn the switch on as fast as it'll fill up, you know, 10 to, to 20, 30 bushel, depending on what seed you're using, that's how much extra time. And if you're my age, by that time, you really need a bathroom break. So uh, it's not costing me any time because uh, if you have an employee that's bringing in a semi into the field, they just pull it down there right in front of you and you just pull under it and flip the button, flip the lid open, flip the button, and that's all the time it takes. So it's two passes in one. So it you know, if you're cutting beans, you might start out at two mile an hour in the morning and you might be up to four and a half mile an hour in the evening and, and picking corn, we're picking at four mile an hour to four and a half mile an hour and, and, and the cedars on it are not hydraulic. So we just know what, where to set it to run at those speeds and it comes out very accurately. Great. Um, and another one for you, Ray, um, you mentioned mixes for grazing cattle. Can you talk more about, I, this person asked about your six-way cover crop mix for grazing cattle. Okay, so that's, I wanted to touch on that, but again, limited time. What we've really used to convert over, and so we're keeping heifers as fast as we can, is that we're baling haylage. So the 60-40 mix of annual ryegrass and clover makes a wonderful uh, haylage. So on those fields, maybe 50 to 75 acres a year, we fertilize it in the spring, put all the corn fertilizer on there, and that boosts that cover crop up. And then we bale it for haylage. So we only have to wait one day to bale that up and wrap it in plastic. So that's, that's the part of the system that has really made our cattle operation grow. Then we plant into that once it's come up. A lot of our crops is non-GMO, so you have to wait to, for it to come up to spray it. If it was non-GMO, or if it was GMO, you can wait and spray it with Roundup. If it's non-GMO, which most of my ground is, then you got to wait for it to come up, spray it, and then plant into it. Uh, where we're grazing cattle, we use a normal mix, or we might add turnips or more turnips because uh, purple top turnips are very good feed, but it's again, it's a, usually that 60-40 mix. And uh, when we're grazing it, we'll pull the cattle off of there or put them on there depending on the soil conditions. But uh, normally we don't run them in the fall because we don't have enough growth. We'll put them on there in the spring and calve into it. So instead of round bales and mud and slop where the calves are being born, they're being born out into you know, need a waist high cover crop. So they're clean, they're neat, they're healthy, they're hidden. And, uh, you know, calving out in cover crops is, is a real joy because they're healthy and they're not muddy. They're, the udders of the cows are clean. So uh, we utilize most of the cover crop for grazing in the springtime. Perfect, thank you. Um, that was great. Um, question for Ryan now. Um, so this is about when you're knifing your anhydrous into the cover crop. Um, Becca's wondering if your stand is damaged at all. So, and do you see differences in N availability with knifing anhydrous into the cover? Um, you know, of course the, the stand is gonna be, be damaged in that strip, right? So um, I guess our, our goal is in that 
instance is to have a clean strip for the you know for the corn for the following year um you know you do get some crowding back into that strip of course with with growth um you know later in the fall uh everything we've done there has been with with um oats and crimson clover or oats and and radish uh, i should say um you know, so mainly it's been stuff that would winter kill. Um, I guess the crimson clover was not stuff that we we knocked in hydro do, but um, you know, so so we we basically it's winter killing, so we've got a, a clean field the following spring. So um, really, have not seen any difference, I guess, in terms of, of nitrogen ability or availability there. So. So I have a question um, for Ray and Ryan for you both. Um, you know, you both have been tinkering and like toying and, and, and you know, innovating and, and doing different ways of seeding your cover crop. I'm curious if um, you've noticed um, either your neighbors or other people trying similar things. So do you feel like other people are, are now, you know, for Ray, like, like putting the seed boxes on, on their combine heads or Ryan, you know, doing what you're doing as well? Like, do you, do you feel like it's your, what you're doing is sort of influencing the others around you or do you still feel like you're sort of on your own out there um, with your tinkering Ryan you can start since you're already um, up I uh, um, I don't think we've you know I don't think we've really got any neighbors that are uh, you know have, have implemented any of those practices because they see what we do you know and I guess that's one thing that um, or if we're seeing it, it, it's very, very slow. You know, that adoption phase, there's, it seems like has been, uh, you know, has been very slow. So, you know, we get questions about it from neighbors, but um, we're still in a very predominantly uh, conventional till area. You know, we do see in, in this part of Illinois, you know, like, like Ray talked about the variation in, in uh, um, you know, in soil types and rolling ground and flat black. And so we have a lot of that, uh, a lot of that here. We don't farm any river bottom ground, but we have a lot of flat black, very productive ground. And if you farm in Western Illinois, you're going to have some timber soils and, and less productive, you know, soils as well. So you, you do see some, you know, a, a little bit of additional use of cover crops and those more rolling, um, timber soils, the, the, you know, highly erodible type ground, but, uh, it's still in our area very, very minimal, so. Ray, what about you? Well, it's frustrating because of all the mistakes I've made and the wrong things I've done in the years of no tilling using cover crop, putting those cedars on the head is the best thing I've ever done. It works every time I've been able to reduce my seeding rates but has it caught on? Not that I'm aware of. I'm aware there are people that are doing it, but Gandhi has not promoted it. No one's really out there promoting it. So it's frustrating that at least in the lower corn belt, it's a real time saver. It's a money maker. Flying on with an airplane is $14, $15 an acre or so forth. So, you know, it's, it's uh, frustrating that a lot of farmers aren't doing it because it works so well. And it's frustrating that the people that manufacture corn heads don't not put a box there. They just don't incorporate. They could incorporate the seed storage right on the top bar of the corn head where you wouldn't hardly even see it was there. And you could buy that option on a corn head to put on cover crops. But, you know, I, it works for me great. And I talk to as many people. And anytime I give a talk, I get the most questions on that. So there's a lot of interest. But I think there's reluctancy in people to want to stop and fill up their cedar or modify their corn head and so forth. So it's frustrating. Lydia, I, I would be interested in responding too. Please. So before the drill combine on Graceland's test spots, we have about 50 acres and we rotate it, corn and soybeans. We, from the beginning, as from about 2010 forward, we committed to a no-till environment. But uh, first we drilled, in, drilled on in certain places and then we flew on. And even I remember uh, in, here we are, South Central Iowa and the soil we have in South Central Iowa, nothing against my Missouri friends, hang in there with me, but it's a little bit more Missouri soil, uh, North Central Missouri soil than it is um, middle uh, Iowa soil. So this, in other words, we have very little topsoil. We have a, a lot of pasture and a lot of timber in the area. 
And so there's been a tendency for farmers in our area to look to cover crop, maybe a, out of necessity or more interest. There's more green cover crop growing around us now. They're doing different methods from flying. Uh, and we also have some pilots in the area. So there's some cover crop getting flown on here and there are some that's getting drilled in. And uh, I do remember someone asking me uh, about our test plot. What, what, what's, what's green growing out there on that acreage in the first year or two that we did it? That's how I'll say rare cover crop was here in what, uh, 2012 or 13. And so, but since then, our neighbor, a number of our neighbors have some pretty green looking fields this fall. Not that they used the drill combine, uh, not that they used any of our systems that we just talked about, but there's, uh, there's a movement in that direction in Decatur County, Iowa. Great. Well, you all are certainly, oops, there's a little feedback there. You all are certainly uh, pioneers and appreciate you sharing and hopefully you've inspired some others um, on this call today. We're getting close to time, but I do want to ask one more question that's um, come up from a couple people now in the chat box. It's about um, single passing on sort of hillier, steeper terrains. So we've had a couple questions about any advice if you had a smaller tractor or any advice on how to, you know, tweak the system to have a single pass when you might be working on, on hillier terrain. Ray, I think maybe, I'm not sure if you'd be the best person to, to try answering that one. Well, one important thing is before we go to that is on my contracts with landlords, it guarantees that it will be no tilled with a cover crop. So I grow cover crops on all my landlords. My neighbors farm 20,000 acres and it's in their contracts. So, you know, guaranteeing your landlord that it will be green and beautiful out there is an advantage and so forth. On the part about steep terrain, you certainly don't want to have ultra low rates. I, I mean, we put it on at 10 pounds an acre sometime because the system so uniformly spreads the seed in the spring, you go, why'd I plant it so thick? But certainly on those, and we got some very steep hills, uh, you wanna keep that seeding rate up to help prevent as much erosion as possible. My neighbors talk about, well, we've spent two days uh, fixing all the gullies and everything. I don't ever do that. We don't fix gullies because there are none. So, you know, it's a time saver, but it's certainly on the steeper terrain. You want to maybe pick a little earlier, plant a little earlier season varieties, get a better stand and try to keep that erosion in check on steep terrain. Thanks, Ray. Now, I hate to cut off conversation because I think there's a lot of good questions and I think you all have a lot of really valuable information to share, but I do want to stay on time. We are at the top of the hour at 11 a.m. So I just want to thank everyone who joined us today for this session and I want to give a big thank you to Ryan, Ray, and Max for sharing their experiences and being so generous with their time this morning. Really appreciate it.